God brought forward all living things, creating the heavens and the earth. He is the way, the truth, and life. God is the creator who made us. The breath of the Almighty gives us life. Life given to all. Well, welcome to all of you who are here, those that are online at our various sites. Glad that we're together, and it's my first opportunity to say Happy New Year to you. I prepared a message that speaks about the value of life for the preborn, and I want to get to that in a moment, but it just seems wise that we would stop and reflect about what happened in our country this past week. Uh, Carrie and I had um, a little bit of a laugh with a neighbor that we ran into on a walk uh, just a week ago, and she said... I th- something really quite insightful, with a lot of enthusiasm. She said, 2020 is behind us. And now that 2021 is here, don't touch anything. (laughs) And we just, yeah, we just recognize the the sentiment of that. But the reality is we know that turning the page to a new calendar year does not automatically fix or change anything. And we saw that on Wednesday, January 6th, when our nation was touched by violence um, after being stormed by protesters. One leader said, um, it is a dark day for America, and it is. And another leader said, it is a date which will live on in infamy, and it will. We watched it. You watched it. And were you not shocked that this could happen in America to the people's house? It was astonishing for us to take it in, and it can leave many of us feeling Confused, at the very least, maybe fearful, um, maybe anxious, a heightened sense of concern about what's ahead for our country and our own personal safety. Do we have law and order any longer in our communities where we feel like we can even be out and about? Who are we becoming as a nation? We're experiencing a tearing in the fabric of our democracy. And it's a humbling time, to say the least. And I hope your mind goes to the question, what can I do? Because that's the distinctive of our given nation. What can I do? And I think there are things we can do. And I want to suggest two of them for us. First, let's recover the practice of civil discourse. You know, the beautiful art of thinking together. Agreeing to disagree, let's recover that. And that begins with us, not with politicians. So we have a lot of anger. We want to deflect to those who made all of this happen. But it really truly does begin with us. Just look at the last year. And we have witnessed firsthand a tearing apart of our relationships, of our families, of the communities in which we live, as well as the uh, faith communities that we attend, unlike we have seen in um, a long time in this country. Now, the healing begins at the dinner tables of our homes. It begins with our words and our discourse. It begins with our attitudes and our behavior. It begins with how we use social media and how we respond to our elected leaders um, or just to people in general. It starts there. But then also, and my second suggestion for us as people of God is let's return to our first love, Jesus Christ, who set before us with such clarity what is most important in life. There's nothing confusing about it. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when that happens, a river of life and love flows in us. It changes us and out into the relationships that we have. We influence our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, our country. We have that sacred privilege because the healing is satisfied at God's table. And I want to pinch yourself, but we get to dine with the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit every day. The table of God is the best table. And it's the table of our wounded healer, Jesus, who sets forth a plan to bring help and healing to us personally, collectively, and to our nation as a whole.
Now, many of you know, if you've been around here, that I choose a word for Westwood, a, year, a word for the year for us. You know? And last year, I chose a word that honestly was quite prophetic, if, if you recall it. The word was pivot. I don't have the spiritual gift of prophecy, but I think it's the most prophetic word I've given in 25 years. <laughs> you know? Pivot. I mean, we have to pivot. Did we know what would be ahead? No, we did not. But it was the right word. My 2021 word, I think, I chose it in December, but it's already finding itself to be quite fitting. And I choose a verse to go along with each of these, but the word for 2021 is forward, straining toward what lies ahead. It carries the idea that we're going this direction, but there's an effort involved with it. Grounded in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, it's our theme verse. I encourage you to memorize it with your families. Um, if you go to the program electronically, you can copy it. We created a bookmark for you. You can put it on the refrigerator, but put it in heart and mind. And would you unite your voices in a spirit of unity together in Jesus Christ? And let's recite these words together. This is our theme verse. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forward, straining to what lies ahead. It won't be easy. It will require eyes that see and faith that believes, and courage that will do, and then the hope to endure and at the heart of it is this question, in what direction is your life moving? Where are you giving your energy? Are you moving back toward what was with the hope that we'll have some semblance of normalcy concerning what that was? I would say, make that history. And strain toward what is forward, ahead of us, what is and what can be in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying here, is Christ redeems the reality of our present and our future for his purposes. Let's welcome that. Let's lean forward into that. Let's memorize those words, make it part of heart and mind, and trust God to help us and our nation. Before I jump into my message, um, we just could use a little prayer. I could too, by the way. These are hard issues we're going to jump into these weeks, but they're important, so important for us. So can we take just a brief moment of silence? Will you pray for our nation? How you ask, pray for the first thing that comes to your mind. Join me. Let's pray silently before the Lord. Oh Lord, you alone have eyes to see. You alone have ears to hear. I pray that you have welcomed these prayers that we have offered up to you. And you alone have a mighty right hand that can lead and guide to transform that which is broken into new life. We pray that for our personal lives, for our families, our communities, and especially our nation these days. Bring healing to our land, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You ready to switch gear for me, <laughs> with me on this? It's a big subject today. And, uh, you know, usually I hear from you, uh, our church family, after I give a message. And then occasionally, in certain series like this one, I hear from you before. <laughs> And I've heard from a lot of you, and uh, for whatever the topic is in these weeks ahead, I just want to say thank you for reaching out. Your words have been insightful, um, helpful. They've shaped part of what I even put together today. We start with uh, this series at the beginning of the year called Life Givers because that's who, love, uh, uh, that's who God is, and it's what God values most, life. He, he loves it when we receive life in his name, and he loves it when we give to others life in his name. And we're looking at four life-giving opportunities related to the unborn today, um, to racial healing, and then to uh, homelessness, and to refugees. They are at the center of much of our political debate. There's so much battle, and we separate between the right and the wrong. The walls go up, and it's difficult to even have that dialogue that I spoke about. But can I just say this? These are not political realities first. These are spiritual realities first. And therefore, 
Um, I want us to understand these arenas through the experience of God's first love that lies at the base of human relationships. And that's my starting place in each of these messages. For those who are newer to Westwood, we teach that there is a rhythm to life and we're wise to learn it. God gives, we receive, we give, God receives honor. My message today is simply, once we receive God's life, we become his ambassadors for life. We become his promoters, his champions of all life, seeking the flourishing of every life from its beginning to its end. And that's why there's so much compassionate concern over the loss of an unborn child rising from an unintended pregnancy. So we hear the word abortion and immediately the walls go up right away and yet the word abortion needs some clarity because it's been hijacked as well. The word refers to a fetus that is lost before 20 weeks. However, the medical community has many classifications for that word abortion. But oftentimes we're not privy to it and I myself needed a little more education and I spent some time looking at it. I could not believe how many classifications there are to abortion. I don't have the time to address them all, but I am going to raise the two most common that you're most familiar with, and that is spontaneous abortion. We know that as one who's had a miscarriage, and they are beyond the mother's control. And many of you have experienced firsthand that grief of losing an unborn child beyond your control and the pain that has accompanied it. And we respect the dignity of that little one's life, and we recognize that there is a loss of hopes and dreams for those um, soon-to-be expectant parents when this happens. By the way, they are the majority of abortions, the spontaneous abortions. But then there's the elective abortion, those requested for reasons other than maternal health or fetal disease by someone who has an unplanned or an unintended or maybe even an unwanted pregnancy. And yet, let's be mindful that the decision for a woman to move in this direction is still a painful one for her. It's not without careful thought, and we want to be mindful of that. According to the Guttenmacher Institute's 2017 report, 18% of pregnancies, excluding miscarriages, ended in abortion. That's about 800,000 a year in America alone, and it's to this latter category that I give my attention today. Practically, that means some of you who are in our female audience um, have experienced uh, an abortion by choice in this way. And some of you in our male audience have encouraged one. And for many, it carries a great weight of shame. I entered into um, a place of learning about this great weight of shame um, in my um, later 20s. I was only in ministry for five years at the time. I received an invitation from a local um, organization that provides support to women who've gone through an abortion, and they asked if I would come and address the subject of shame and guilt over a two-week window. I did that for a number of years. And there would be approximately 20, 25 women in the room Um, All of them were over 40, which was interesting because sometimes it's later in life the reality comes full force upon many. But these women taught me so much about honesty and transparency, about humility and repentance and hope and freedom, true freedom. And I'm so grateful for those years. And through 40 years in pastoral ministry, many women have reached out to the previous church I was part of and to Westwood Church, and I'm so grateful for that. And what's changed in the last 10 years is is really quite astonishing, and I think it needs to be applauded. For the first time for me in 40 years of ministry, until this last 10 years, I had not seen young men come seeking help because they've encouraged an abortion. And that's happening today. So I applaud and commend young men and all men who would enter into that place of help and healing. I want to address the question today, how do we succeed together to value life of the unborn? I want to give you three primary expressions. I think we need to start, though, with the hope of the gospel. I'd like to have an amen after that. (laughs) Because isn't that where we start in life? As we address these hard issues, we start with the hope of the gospel, that God loves us, he comes to us, he enters into the reality of our brokenness, and he dies for it, and he rises again to set us free. So we're no longer in the bondage of that. He does that. That's the gospel. 
Veronica Sexton was uh, changed by the hope of the gospel, and I came across her article in my research and preparation for this message, and boy, did it capture my attention. It was powerful. The title of her article, What I Wish I'd Heard from the Church After Having an Abortion. <clears throat> and being that I would be speaking, you know, I think it was the title that stood out most in all the research that I did. She begins with a really harsh question because I think the reality is we need to hear from her. She's gone through it, and I'll tell you, she wraps the gospel. She's experienced it. I, I could never say it as well as she does. I just want to start where she starts. Hard question. How does it feel to be a murderer? My friend says this as she recounts a conversation she had with a woman recently who had had an abortion. I'm not afraid to confront people about the air of their ways, my friend adds. My throat and chest tighten. Will this woman who my friend cruelly condemned, ever come to know God's amazing grace in her lifetime, the extent of God's mercy and love for me again comes into focus and I'm filled with gratitude because I had an abortion too. An abortion is never plan A. Nearly 20 years ago, I was lost. I acted lost. I had the abortion because <clears throat> I believed I had no other choice. I grew up in a broken home where I felt neglected. I sought the affection from boys and then I was date raped at 15. I felt worthless and I continued to seek validation from men as I grew older. And because I already battled depression, my psychiatrist encouraged me to have an abortion when I became pregnant. And immediately afterward and for years, I carried the tremendous weight of this decision and others like a cloak of shame. Regardless of the circumstances which led to the abortion, I made that choice exclamation mark. How could I ever know forgiveness? And yet, she says, forgiveness is possible. In my darkest hour, I begged God to save me, to forgive me. Through God's grace alone, I came to know total forgiveness. He set me free from my cloak of shame and from the victim mentality that I had lugged around my whole life. And if he can do that for me, then forgiveness, redemption, and healing are there for anyone and for anything. What women need now in the comfort of God's grace, this occurs to me. If an ambassador of Christ had greeted me 15 years ago the way my friend did, I would have run away from the church and the redeeming message of Jesus Christ. Romans 8.1 tells us, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but rather than operating as the hands and the feet of Jesus, by sitting with sinners and extending God's grace, love, and compassion, we too often hear Christians yelling, murderer, murderer. So is it any wonder that people hide their sin and shame lurking in the shadows rather than taking it to the church which should be a house of hope and healing? Extending God's grace through love and mercy doesn't mean we condone sin. It means we're pointing others to the Savior we all desperately need. It means we first show compassion toward individuals as Jesus did because truly, and I love what she says here, don't we all feel the weight of the sins and secrets that we carry? I did. So instead of pointing a condemning finger, maybe we should point others toward the freedom of the cross. Isn't that beautifully written? I'm sure you can say it better than me. That we all come together at the foot of the same cross. It's level ground. There's no one here better than anyone else. And abortion is not the unforgivable sin in life and journey. In fact, the grace of God is the salve that heals all of our wounds. So how do we succeed together to value life of the unborn? Well, we start with the hope of the gospel, but then we live with the truth that all life comes from God. Do we embrace that? That's our, our, our building point from our starting place of the gospel, that God is a life giver, and God's word reminds us that all life comes from him. So we promote life because once we enter into that personal relationship with the living God, once you've entered into that, your eyes change and you can see that God is completely obsessed with life. When you read the scriptures, it is everywhere. So let me just let the scriptures speak for themselves. When God created the waters, we're told that they were teeming with life. Or we find that Jesus is called the bread of life. He is the resurrection and life. He is the word of life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He offers the promise of life, the crown of life, the tree of life. And for those who receive him as quote-unquote 
the prince of life, Jesus offers eternal life. John 20, 31. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by so believing that you would have life in his name. And then it says in 2 Timothy that Jesus' mission was to come to abolish death, to invade our culture of death, to redeem what we keep taking away from what God intended to have life. And we'll find that the last act in history will be God ridding the earth of death and ushering in the age of life where we will eat from the quote unquote tree of life and we will drink from the quote unquote water of life. It goes on and on. That's why we join with thousands of churches this month across America upholding the value of human life from the moment of conception to the moment of death. Read some fascinating articles in preparation for today. One was <clears throat> written by Lou D. Ireland in 2019. She's an obstetrician, a gynecologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical School who wrote in the academic journal called The Conversation these words, speaking about why women have abortions. Um, that was an article I, I just had to lean into. And she said, one important group's voice is often absent in this heated debate, the women who choose abortion. Stigma keeps their stories untold, but I hear their stories daily. And then the article goes and unpacks the voices of these women, their reasons. And there are so many, and I just tracked one story after the other, after the other. It could be fear, it could be the lack of readiness to have a child come into the home, it could be vulnerability with finances, it could be the expectations of family members or churches. And for some even, even though it's minuscule in terms of statistics, would be those who experienced uh, pregnancy because of rape um, and that kind of trauma as we heard from Veronica in her story. But I felt the struggle of each of these women as they're wrestling through this decision and their life and what's ahead for them. And so we need to hear their voices and we want to hear their voices. But we also need to encourage the hearing of God's voice first. I know why we do this. He becomes a parenthetical thought sometimes in our conversation. But we need to hear his voice first. And to the surprise of many, um, his voice is marked with mercy and love and compassion and understanding and, uh, and a sense of purpose for life. And I think many of us were raised in so much fear of the wrath of God that we've missed the voice of the love of God that meets us that would cause him to send Jesus Christ into the world in which we live. So you consider these words portraying God's intimate involvement with a preborn person as with David when he created his quote-unquote inward parts not at birth but before birth. We read it in Psalm 139. Why don't you help me with this even if you're at home and, and share and read out loud with me these verses but apply them in your own personal life. Join me. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. How much does God know about the unborn um, little one in a womb? Everything, everything. So God takes those little tiny hands and feet and he joins them together and he forms that heart and he sets it to beating. That's God's directive. Or how about Jeremiah 1.5? God says to the prophet, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. That happened while he was in the womb. So we, get, we value life because God is the one who's working even in the womb concerning our purposes. His fingerprints are already in motion. And I love this example from Luke 1. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. I love this story because we just came out of Christmas. We find Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus, going to greet Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. And as these two expectant mothers greet and actually face each other, Elizabeth's baby, the yet-to-be-born John the Baptist, leaps for joy in the womb. How this gets, he's already expressing praise and worship to God. Because that little baby's fully human. Who gives life? God does. 
Therefore, we believe in the sanctity of all human life, born and unborn. A friend of mine, um, prolific author and wonderful pastor and teacher is Rich Nathan, and he says it this way. Human beings, all human beings, able-bodied or born with disabilities, wealthy or poor, wanted or unwanted, dark-skinned or light-skinned, all human beings deserve the right to life. So we advocate, we promote this life. How do we succeed together to value life of the unborn? We start with the hope of the gospel. We live with the truth that all life comes from God. And then briefly, we become God's ambassador for life. That is, we promote life, we protect life, we become the uh, wounded healers of people. That was God's intention for us. And the good news for those that are facing unplanned pregnancies today is, is really amazing because churches and all these helping centers in the last 20 years kind of got their act together. And finally, we're offering things that are making a difference to help make that decision better with alternative choices, whether that relates to providing um, financial assistance or legal counsel or bringing in medical services or housing and jobs and all kinds of opportunities, even assistance to help you keep the child as well as to consider what what it would be to place the child up for adoption. And I just want to declare here that all of you know Westwood will be always in a position where we will welcome the conversation to bring help and hope where we can. And somebody, an anonymous giver, I don't even know who you are, but I want to thank you, whoever you are, who gave a gift to us uh, to the end that we were able to establish an adoption and foster care grant to help Westwood members who are choosing to help with foster care or to assist in the adoption process. So I say thank you. Generosity goes a long way. Maybe you could join me in saying thank you to whoever that person is. I think we want to give thanks. It takes people who see and say, I want to be part of this solution in the journey. And one of Westwood's ministry partners is New Life Family Services. They're on site with us at our, our, our various sites today. And their mission is to honor the sanctity of human life by assisting clients in life-affirming decisions with the love and compassion of Christ. Their services are varied and they are fantastic and they've been doing this as long as I've been in ministry and I'm an old guy now, they've been here and I'm so grateful to have partnered with them through the years. And one of the ways they help is through their new life adoption service. So hey, wherever you are right now, could you just settle in for a moment? Take in this most amazing story of redemption. Join me, take it in. Hello, uh, my name is Eric, this is Jennifer, and we adopted all three of our kids through New Life Adoptions. Uh, Alexander is 15, Eliana is 13, and Ava is 9. So my journey started uh, when I was in high school. I am a cancer survivor, and as a result, couldn't have my own kids. Um, Jennifer and I spent many, many years going through the process of what do we want to do, um, looking at other alternative ways to have kids, and and we just really felt like God was leading us down the path of adoption. And that's how we got in touch with New Life. And the neat thing was once we actually decided on New Life, nine months later, Alex was born. I found out I was pregnant when I was 19 and the man who I got pregnant by uh, wanted me to have an abortion and I didn't and was kind of on my own as far as that goes. And my parents had some friends that had adopted through New Life, I truly think it was God working in me. I wasn't following him at the time, but I felt his leading to a place, Alex, in a home that had a mom and a dad and a stable home with everything that he deserved and needed. She called us in labor, which was very special. Um, and she told us that she had chosen us to, to adopt you. I'm gonna get weepy. It's pretty cool. Yes. It's really hard to be pregnant and pick out a, a couple that, like, oh, they were gonna raise my child. Um, but Eric and Jennifer really stood out as uh, just down to earth. For me, I know the heart of the mom is so broken during this time. And she had given Alex to Eric first, and that was a really special thing because for her, she wanted him to have a dad. And so Eric was the first to hold him. And then I remember getting in the elevator 
just the two of us, nobody else, and Alex, and like, we're bringing home a baby. We found out when he was two that he has a rare syndrome called San Filippo syndrome. And at the time they said he'd live to 10, but he is now 15. <laughs> and I always cry, I try not to, <laughs> but it happens. He's 15, so he's a little miracle, and he's, he's a joy. Um, it's, it's been a tough road, um, but it's shaped us into who we are today. Uh, it's shaped many people. I love him, and I believe he loves me. He is not able to communicate, but his heart has been so big since he was born and he has stolen the hearts of so many people over the years and um, it was because of Alexander's sickness that I think I was as soft as I was to just like God broke in and was able to do that I believe because of the adoption and because of Alexander's sickness and because of just where I was emotionally at that time. But God just really was able to do a work, and I called my mom, and then I called Jennifer, Alexander's mom, and told her that I had been saved. I did not realize I was pregnant until like five months along, and it was a scary, scary situation. I was in a relationship, but it was uh, tragically falling apart. Went to bed one night, and it was one of those God moments, and... <laughs> Sorry. Realizing that I was going to deny a family or deny this child a life that she deserved, I realized that I couldn't be that selfish. I couldn't do it any longer. So I woke up the next morning and called New Life Adoptions. The story of Eliana starts with her name um, because Eliana means God has answered our prayers. We didn't know about Alex's diagnosis until after, was, after Ellie was born, but there is nobody that brought more sunshine into our lives in the first dark days of Alex than Eliana. She was born right at the same time that they were going through a very dark time with their um, first son, and so she was really needed in their and so, um, it was really meant to be. When I found myself pregnant, I was not in a very good place in life. I was in college. I was probably at rock bottom, and I remember laying in bed one night praying after not praying for a very long time, and I asked God to please help me. I can't get out of this lifestyle. I don't know what else to do, and then, I found out I was pregnant shortly after that, maybe a week or two later, but ultimately he ended up using that to save my life was me finding out I was pregnant. From the moment I found out I was pregnant, I knew I was pregnant with a girl and I knew her name was being Ava. And that was something that was important to me, that her name not be changed. I um, got a phone call from our social worker who said, I was talking to Kelsey and she has named this baby from the very, as soon as she found out that she was a girl, she had named, given her a name and she was really hoping that you would use it. And the name is? And she said the name was Ava and I was like, what? That's my favorite name, so of course. <laughs> it's a beautiful name and it fits her perfectly. Yes. We're all a family now. It's not us and the birth moms, it's, we are all together. Um, it's more people that love these kids, and I love Leah, I love Kelsey, I love Kathy, um, and they're a part of our lives forever. The only thing that I wanted 13 years ago was a better future for her, which is why I went with New Life Adoptions. To go into New Life and not be judged and just offered support and counsel and help and love and compassion is just, it's a life changer. Because of what I did with Ava, she has a better life than what I could have provided. And I think that's going to just be passed down to her kids and their kids. And I feel like it just, it just has a ripple effect. So I think adoption is a wonderful thing. I think it's, it's beautiful and God uses it for good.
Well, they um, teach sacrificial love. Yes. That's the biggest thing that they've taught me is that, that is true, very true. love that they have for their kids is no different than anybody else's love for their kids. Um, and yet they are in a situation that they are, they are giving up what is most dear to them because they know that it's the right thing to do. It's so unselfish and it teaches love, real love. Love, real love. I don't know. Yeah, yes. that's that's what it is. Authentic sacrificial love. When you're in grief and you're in pain, it's 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 incredibly difficult to make a a decision for another human being. And that's what new life adoptions does. Is it gives you options. Now I have a husband and three children, and I'm expecting number four, technically number five, but <laughs> life is good. I have found hope because I see the way that Ellie's grown up. I know that I could never give her the life that she has. Eliana is a wonderful girl who is thriving and has two amazing siblings and parents who love her and adore her, and she has friends, and I couldn't have dreamed of those things for her. 13 years ago. God came after me and he saved me and he rescued Ava and looking back on my story, God's work is everywhere. I've seen that 10 times. <laughs> Why is it still grab me every time? I think Alex, Aliana, Ava, they're here. They have purpose. They're bringing blessing. And we rejoice. We're grateful for New Life Family Services and the work that they do in our community. Throughout this series, the four issues that we're giving attention to, we are um, coining this the power of one. It is our hope that in 2021, that as you feel stirred up, you would choose one of these ministry areas where you could li raise the bar of your personal engagement. So the power of one really makes a difference. How might you be a life giver, perhaps in one of these four arenas in 2021? Well, you could stop by today if you're on our sites. The New Life Family Services table is there. Just learn about who they are. They have materials. You can get a little bit more education. Um, or if you're online as well, you can reach out to um, New Life Services and just make yourself available or learn more. In Richfield, uh, they have some special needs right now. They're looking for English and uh, Spanish-speaking coaches to come alongside of, uh, of parents in this time of transition. So if that's something you could do, great. They also have a closet of clothing that needs uh, more management and care. If you can volunteer services there, they need sonographers, other things. But you can reach out to their service in Richfield. They're available to you as well. But they also want and encourage us to be part of their prayer journey because this is all needing to be covered through prayer. So you can, you know, text New Life Prayer to the number on the screen and receive frequent prayer requests. It's a great way to get involved and not difficult for us to do that, to offer prayer there. But we hope you'll consider praying, um, choosing one as the Lord stirs you in one of these uh, messages that we give and opportunities that we have on-site partners that will be with us to, to raise that bar in 2021. We encourage you to do that. So take a step, you know. What, what step could you take to make a difference? Or what attitude could you change, perhaps? Or even what person could you help? That's what God is calling us to do. Be life givers because we have received his life. So I invite you to stand, join me, and receive this benediction. We've said this um, for a long time in our journey at Westwood, if we could only get the love thing right, there's no end to what we could be or do for God's glory or for the good of his creation. We don't always get it right, but we want to get it right. And I pray that you will live in the rhythm of life knowing God gives. He really does. We get to receive. We really do. <laughs> we get to give away from that which he gives to us. What a privilege. And he receives glory, honor, and praise. So we rejoice. Be blessed. On this day, go be his life givers. Amen.